Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Biggest Ideas in the Universe. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. We're on our fourth idea already. Plenty more ideas in the future. It does strike me as I'm making these, for those of you future people watching, uh, I'm recording these during the coronavirus lockdown, and it was about time for me to get a haircut just before the lockdown started, and there's no prospects of haircuts anywhere in the immediate future. Jennifer, my wife, and I both have various skills. Cutting hair is not among them, so it could be kind of an adventure going forward with more and more ideas and more and more length of the hair, but... We all have to make our little sacrifices. Anyway, today our fourth idea is space. I don't mean space, the final frontier, or outer space, anything like that. I mean the three-dimensional space in which we live. This is clearly a big idea. Um, the question is, to what extent is it an interesting idea? In the sense, is there anything to say about it? I mean, there's a, there's a point of view about space which just says... It's a primitive thing. That's where we live, right? There's no choice about it. Philosophers argue over whether Immanuel Kant thought that three-dimensional Euclidean space was somehow a priori, like it couldn't have been any other way. There's, there's no way that we could have the sensory capabilities and the vision, uh, the, the ability to sort of envision the world the way we do if we didn't live in three-dimensional Euclidean space. Euclidean, in this case, means something that Kant didn't even know that it meant, the geometry of space itself. And of course, Einstein came along to say that the geometry of space is not Euclidean. Space is part of space-time, it can be curved, etc. So whatever it is, we don't these days think of space as just inevitable, okay? We can ask why space has the properties it does. A lot of these questions are going to happen within the context of quantum mechanics and quantum gravity. We're not there yet. Uh, we're not being perfectly historical, but still in this particular video, we're mostly working in the context of classical physics, maybe 100% in classical physics. And uh, we're, I'm going to talk a little bit about some features of general relativity, although it's not the main, we haven't talked about general relativity yet. That's a future video, so we're not going to be diving into it too deeply. Okay, what I do want to talk about is, well, what is the most important feature that you first notice about space? You know, space, like I said, is the place we live, the set of points that you would use to locate somebody, okay? The set of possible positions that a point could have, that's what we mean by space. And the first thing we know about space is that it is three-dimensional, okay? What do we mean by that? Well, the dimensions are up, down, left, right, forward, backward. How do we know? that space is three-dimensional. How certain are we of this? So experimentally, I'm not gonna do the experiment, I'm gonna draw the experiment on the, on the iPad here. Uh, experimentally, here's something we can do. We can imagine a line. So, you know, you imagine holding up a stick and it's, there's no difficulty in taking another line and drawing it at 40, at rather a right angle perpendicular, okay, to the first line. I'm doing this on a two-dimensional surface, so let's think about this two-dimensional surface before we move to three-dimensional space. No problem in taking two lines and putting them perpendicular to each other in space, but here on the surface where I'm drawing, that's it. That's all you can do. There's no way for me to draw another line, a third straight line, that is perpendicular to both of these two at the same time. Uh, the maximum number of perpendicular lines that I can draw on this two-dimensional surface is two. That is why it is a two-dimensional surface, because there are only two directions where a direction is defined as a perpendicular way that you could potentially move. Now in space, if I'm not just on the iPad, but if I'm living in the room here, uh, there's another direction I can draw, which we typically draw in pictures as sort of at an angle, but of course it's a cheat a little bit, okay. It's not truly um, on, the, on the board, it's not perpendicular, but we are imagining that we're here in space where I could hold up a stick in one dimension, hold up another stick perpendicular to it, and hold up a third stick perpendicular to both of those. So voila, space in which we live is three-dimensional. Try as you will in the space in which we live, you cannot take four sticks, hold them up in a way that each one of them is perpendicular to all the other three. So space is not four-dimensional, it's three-dimensional. That's it. That's why space is three-dimensional. That's why we know space is three-dimensional. But why is space three-dimensional? I mean, why is it like that? Why are there three dimensions rather than some other number? So if we were, if we were being um, historically accurate and sort of 
what did we talk about last time? Like force and action and things like that. We're still kind of stuck in the 1800s at best. There's not that much you could have said about why space was three-dimensional. Well, what else could it have been? Maybe you could have said, but there were no dynamics. There was no way of saying, well, had it been something else, it would have evolved into three dimensions or anything like that. These days, we know a little bit more, right? And we're, we're skipping ahead historically to point out that when Einstein does come along and in 1915, he invents the general theory of relativity, he not only says that space is part of space-time, which is four-dimensional, not just three-dimensional, but he also says that it has a life of its own, that space can change, that there's a geometry to space that need not be the geometry of Euclid, where initially parallel lines stay parallel forever. Space can be warped, and it can uh, change and be curved in various ways, and you and I experience the curvature of space-time as gravity. And almost as soon as Einstein came up with this idea, people said, well, that's interesting. That means that I can change the dimensionality of space. And so let me just explain a little bit about what that means. Imagine that you, you had two-dimensional universe, okay? Two-dimensional space. So just because it's easier to draw, not because it's actually conceptually more important. In fact, it'd be better if I could draw more dimensions. But imagine that space was two-dimensional, but imagine that it was wrapped up into a cylinder rather than being uh, an infinitely big plane, okay? So here's a cylinder, and imagine it goes on forever in these directions, and this is two-dimensional space. So this is a hypothetical universe in which we certainly don't live, but... Actually, let me move this. Let me use the magic of computers to move this a little bit. Da -da, good. And then we can imagine two different kinds of beings that could live in this universe, okay? One kind of being is really tiny. So a little tiny person here. This little tiny person here says, yeah, space is two-dimensional. I can move up and down, I can move right and left, and I could even, if I'm very fast, I could go around the universe and come back to where I started. Good for me. But there's another kind of being that is harder to draw here, but um, conceptually, let me imagine a being that is sort of, I'm gonna draw them sideways, but a being that is much bigger in length, oops, much bigger in length than the size of this circle, okay? So here they are. And to this person, you know, the size of the circle, the size of one of their dimensions of space is just really tiny. It's just maybe invisibly small. From the point of view of someone who is very, very big, compared to this tiny little dimension of space, to them, this space looks one-dimensional. In other words, if you took this one, this two-dimensional cylinder and looked at it from very far away, it would look like this, right? And that almost begins to look like a one-dimensional line. So it turns out there's a whole longer spiel here, but if you imagine the world is made of fields, which we'll get to in later videos, and you have quantum mechanics, etc., to access a really, really tiny dimension of space requires incredibly high energies. Uh, it becomes, it, there's a relationship in quantum mechanics between distance and energy, that things that are vibrating over very, very short distances have a lot of energy. Just to make this a little more intuitive, you might have heard that blue wavelengths of light that are shorter have higher energy photons associated with them than red wavelengths of light that are longer smaller wavelengths are associated with higher energy. So smaller distances around a certain direction of space are also associated with higher energies. So the point of this, this is called Kaluza-Klein theory, after Tador Kaluza and Oscar Klein, who said to themselves, again, almost right after Einstein came along with general relativity, they said, well, maybe you can imagine that there are tiny dimensions of space that because of the rules of general relativity stay tiny and therefore stay invisible to us. This is an incredibly cool idea. And in fact, it's even better than it sounds because Kaluza and Klein pointed out that you could even try to explain the force of electromagnetism doing this extra one-dimensional circle of space. And that's a story we can't get into right now, but that was the initial motivation, that maybe you could unify gravity and electromagnetism by adding an extra dimension of space and then just making it really tiny and curled up. So 
You may have heard that string theorists and other people in modern physics have taken this idea very seriously. And the string theory needs extra dimensions of space. Strings naturally live in a 10 dimensional space time, so nine dimensional space. So they have to curl up six dimensions of space somehow. There's extra complications because life is complicated. String theory has a version of itself that is an 11 dimensional space time rather than a 10 dimensional space time. But the point is one way or the other, you need these extra dimensions of space. So an enormous amount of effort in modern physics has gone into thinking about ways in which extra dimensions of space could exist but be curled up. I'm not going to talk about those in great detail today. What I, what I want to do instead is say something that actually has not received a lot of attention. Why are some of the dimensions small if they are? Or said the other way, why are three of the dimensions big? So that's the question that I would like to talk about a little bit. Why three macroscopic big dimensions? And this is um, something, again, that can only be talked about in modern physics where you have dynamical space time, et cetera. But still, it, it gives you the reason why I'm doing this is not so much to tell you what the right answer is. No one has any idea what the right answer to this question is, but to let you know that it's a question. Right? to let you know that there are scientific theories that potentially give answers to this particular question. So let me give you one particular scientific theory. This is called string gas cosmology. Again, we're way ahead of uh, the history here. That's okay. And uh, the first paper I know about this is from Robert Brandenberger and Kumrun Vafa. And they made the following cute um, observation. Let's imagine you did have more dimensions of space. Let's imagine you had nine dimensions of space, like string theory uh, says might be the case. And let's imagine that they're all small for some reason. So this is the miracle. This is like the, you know, you're allowed one miracle in your scientific theory. Uh, it's not, I'm just kidding, you're, not, you're allowed zero miracles in your scientific theory, but you're allowed one posit, okay? Like, let's imagine that. So let's imagine that the universe used to be very small. So imagine that all the dimensions are tiny, and I'm going to draw them as a cube. Why am I going to do that? Well, because really what I want to draw is a torus. A torus looks something like this, right? It looks like the external surface of a donut. It's a two-dimensional surface that you can go around in one of two different directions. Um, but another way of drawing this torus, which I just drew, would be to draw a square, but identify the opposite sides. So the point of this picture is to say, if I were a little person living on this square with opposite sides, if I walked upward in this direction, I would then come out here. So it's like a video game, like if you're in my, uh, my era, it would be asteroids where you fly on one side of the video screen and you come out the other. That is secretly a torus. If you take this square, you wrap it up, it becomes a torus. You wrap it up in both dimensions. We're imagining that whatever it is you're wrapping has infinite flexibility, so nothing rips or tears or anything like that. So what I want to draw is a three-dimensional torus. So what I'm going to draw is a cube. And then I'm going to ask you to imagine that the different sides of the cube are identified. Okay. So if I walk into one edge of the cube, I come back into the other edge. So this is a three-dimensional torus. And what I'm really imagining is a nine-dimensional torus, but I cannot draw a nine-dimensional torus. So imagine this three-dimensional torus. And imagine that the world is described by string theory, okay, like Brandenberger and Vafa um, imagined. So what you say is, if you zoom in a little bit, so there's going to be little loops of string. This is what string theory says, and the loops of string are going to be moving around inside the torus. I'm not explaining all of string theory now, but you've heard probably that the basic positive string theory is that instead of particles, the world is made of strings. That's all you need to know for this, uh, this particular demonstration. What Brandenburg and Vafa point out is that in addition, since this whole thing is very, very tiny, in addition to the idea that a string can float around inside the dimensions, strings can also wrap around the whole universe very easily. So since the top of this cube is identified with the bottom, this thing that I just drew, this vertical line, is a loop of string that is wrapped around one dimension of the universe. And this can happen in any of the dimensions of the universe. So we can have another string wrapped around this way. Not the best drawing there, but you know what I mean. Well, let me try to do it better. 
try to get away from the extra parts of my cube here. Okay, there you go. So there are different ways the strings can wrap around. They can wrap around any one of the nine different dimensions of space. But if you have, and this is the part that's hard to uh, visualize, but, but you, you probably can get it. If space were four dimensional, two strings would just generically pass right by each other. Okay, there's, even though you think like two one dimensional things would generically hit each other, that's because you live in three dimensional space. If you imagine two points on a line, two points will always hit each other. In two dimensional space, they will generically move by. Likewise, strings generically move by each other if space is four dimensional, but not if it is three dimensional. So what can happen here is that if these strings are sort of wound around these compact dimensions of space, and the tension in the strings is part of what is contributing to keeping the cube small, keeping the torus at a fixed size, then in three dimensions, these strings, let's see if I can do this. Let's see if I can uh, do some magic here. Move it over, copy it, paste it. Look at that. Oh my goodness, I'm getting good at this, okay. What can happen is this original situation where there's strings wrapping in different directions, these strings are gonna hit each other in some three-dimensional subspace of the nine-dimensional cube. In a four-dimensional subspace, they will just pass right by, but in the three-dimensional part of it, they can hit each other. And when they hit each other, what will happen is this initial situation will change because the strings can reconnect in a certain way so that it looks like this. Okay, see what happened there? The strings were originally just individually crossing, but now they can reconnect and now they can just unwind. So what can happen is this string is now not wrapped around the different dimensions of space. It can just shrink to zero. So what happens then, according to Brandenburger and Vafa, is that this cube can just start growing. It can get bigger and bigger and bigger. Very sloppy cube there, sorry about that. But you get the point. In some three-dimensional subspace of the whole nine-dimensional compact torus, Brandenburger and Waffe say, strings can originally be wrapped around and holding it together, but they can keep hitting each other, unwinding, and those three dimensions can begin to grow. So in other words, Brandenburger and Waffe are both suggesting a scenario for how the universe might have started, right? And originally a tiny little torus that was compact and stationary, but then it unwound a little bit. And also explaining why only three dimensions of space are big. Because if the world is made of strings, three dimensions are the number of dimensions that generically strings can unwind in and let the, those three dimensions expand. Now, I'm not a big fan, actually, of this particular uh, scenario. I loved it when I first heard it. I was a graduate student when this came along. I thought this was like genius, because at least they're trying, right, to explain the three dimensions of space. These days, we know that string theory is not just a theory of strings. In addition to strings, there are things like two-dimensional brains and three-dimensional brains. Brain being a brain, oops, B-R-A-N-E, comes from the word membrane, and it's just a way of saying uh, a surface or a, an object that is more than two-dimensional. So a membrane is two-dimensional, three brains are three-dimensional, etc. So there's actually lots of different ways to wrap strings and brains around initially tiny compact manifolds, and the tiny compact space doesn't have to be a torus. It can be something more complicated. So the initial charm of thinking that you have explained why space is three-dimensional maybe has gone down a little bit when we appreciate the more of the complexity of string theory. But still, again, it's an attempt, right? You know, maybe something like this is actually explaining why space is three-dimensional. So that's a good thing to imagine being doing. Um, I wanna explain tunneling, uh, let, me, let, me, let me say it this way. I would like to explain going for, uh, making dimensions disappear. That's the right, right way of saying it. So the one of the posits of the Brandenburger Waffe model was that dimensions if you wanted to ask why did the universe originally start 
tiny, they say, well, we know it did. So let's just say that it did. And they don't try to explain that part of it. Maybe the universe didn't start tiny, like we're prejudiced a little bit, or at least we are oriented toward the fact that our universe is expanding and therefore it was smaller and therefore it seems natural for us to imagine the universe starting as something small. But we should be more open-minded about that. Maybe it didn't. Is there any way of imagining that there were more than three big dimensions of space and the dimensions somehow disappear? So there is a way, uh, and this way is actually comes from a paper that I helped write. So this is me, uh, Matt Johnson, and Lisa Randall. And we, we point out the following thing, and we borrowed from a lot of other people, as always happens in physics, right? But imagine that you have, um, again, a two-dimensional plane. Imagine this goes out infinitely far, so we're not cheating by already having it be wound up. Um, you might say, well, I want to make a dimension disappear. So the natural thing to imagine is that somehow one of these dimensions just curls up. So this becomes that kind of cylinder that we talked about before, right? But that seems, you know, essentially infinitely unlikely because if this initial plane is infinitely big in all directions, how in the world can it curl up an infinite amount of space in one direction to become some finite sized circle? That seems unlikely. And presumably this is why people have not traditionally looked at the idea of making dimensions disappear. But there is another way to do it. Again, in string theory, although it's not a very stringy construction, you can do it without the details of string theory. And the way to do it is to not wrap up all of the universe, but you dig a hole in space. You're not really doing that, but metaphorically that's what you're doing. In other words, extending a region of space down into a cylindrical kind of configuration. And this goes infinitely far down. So in some region, if you just stretch space, you kind of imagine pulling it and you pull it infinitely far, but it doesn't keep getting smaller and smaller as you pull, rather it stabilizes at some fixed size. If you imagine just looking at, I'm actually gonna uh, invoke a suggestion that was made in the questions to other videos, which is rather than me pointing at my pad that you folks can't see, I should just use another color, so okay. So if you imagine just looking at this part, of the space, right? Well, it looks just like a cylinder. It looks just like the cylinder on the other side, right? If you ignore the fact that it's connected to this wider universe, then this part right here, that part right there looks like a cylinder. So it looks like there's one dimension that is really long and another dimension that is all curled up. Both of these dimensions stand in for many more dimensions than that that I can't draw, okay? So rather than really imagining that you start with a two-dimensional space and dynamically compactifying it, as we say, down to a one-dimensional space plus a tiny circle, we can imagine starting with a, what did we start with? A five-dimensional space, and then we dynamically compactify it down into a big three-dimensional space plus a tiny little two-dimensional sphere. So the realistic scenario is 5D space goes into 3D space times, it's a, mathematically this is a, a product of two different manifolds, times a two-dimensional little sphere, S2 as we call it, okay, two-dimensional sphere. So, well, fine, I mean, I can say these words, right, I can, I can draw these pictures, does it actually happen? Yes, it can happen. In fact, we show very, very simple circumstances in which it must happen, in which quantum mechanics plus gravity plus electromagnetism is all you need. You also need some cosmological constant or other things that we all, all things that we know we have. We showed that if you start in a six dimensional space time, five dimensional space plus one dimensional time, this kind of compactification down to four dimensional space time times a tiny little circle is inevitable, inevitably going to happen some places sometimes. So of course you are then welcome to ask, well, why in the world did you ever start with a six dimensional space time, five dimensions of space that are all really big? I have no answer to that. That was not part of what we did. So again, I'm not trying to give you the final answer, but I'm just pointing out that 
you can get rid of or create big dimensions of space both ways. You can both uh, start small and make some dimensions big. You can start with dimensions big. You can make them disappear effectively by compactifying them into a tiny little ball that you and I could not see. So what this opens up is the idea that maybe the fact that space is three-dimensional is not just a law of nature. It's not just there once and for all, okay? It's not just inevitable, it's just not built in, it's not a priori. Maybe it's something that dynamically happens. And then you might wanna ask, well, okay, if that can happen, then why don't we live in a four-dimensional space or five-dimensional or two-dimensional or eight-dimensional or whatever? That's another good question, right? Is there some principle? Is there some reason why? This is bringing us back to the question we started with. Why actually three dimensions of space? So I don't know the answer to this one either. Sorry, I, you know, I'm just having fun by skipping ahead to some of the more speculative stuff. We're, we're gonna, for the next few lectures, we're gonna do plenty of very well-established things. Don't worry about that. I shouldn't call these lectures. Casual chats about the biggest ideas in the universe. Uh, but we can have fun. You know, we're not, we're not teaching you a course. There's no quiz at the end of this. So why is it actually three dimensions? I have no idea. There was an interesting paper by Max Tegmark Max, of course, is a well-known cosmologist and writer. Uh, Max was a guest on my podcast, Mindscape, a few months ago when we talked about the anthropic principle and the multiverse and other ideas he's a big fan of. And so there was a paper where he applied these ideas to the dimensionality of space. And what he claimed, which I think is a little bit of an, an overclaim, but I can explain why, what he claimed is that there is an anthropic reason why, even if you had many different parts of reality where the dimensionality of space was different, we would find ourselves in the three-dimensional part. So you've heard of the anthropic idea, which is that if there are many different parts of the universe where conditions are very, very different, of course, there is a selection effect, okay? There's a selection bias intelligent creatures are only going to find themselves in those parts of the universe where intelligent creatures can come to be. There you go. So we can apply that kind of reasoning. And you know, by the way, that kind of reasoning is 100% true. I mean, it's almost trivial and tautological. The only controversial part is, does there exist uh, a universe in which different regions have very, very different conditions, like different dimensionalities of space? That we have no idea about, right? But if there are different regions where conditions are very, very different, indeed, there will be a selection effect, and we're only going to find ourselves in those regions where we can exist. Duh. I don't see how you can even uh, argue against that. So here's what, here's what he says. Well, what if the dimensionality of space D was less than three. So let's go one by one. Let's imagine that it was just two dimensional. Here's two dimensional space, okay? 2D space. Could we live in 2D space? And what Max says is basically no, because it's too simple. There's not really a lot that can happen in two dimensional space. So what does that mean? I mean, basically what it means is, you know, the famous idea is um, if you wanted to have uh, an animal, okay, here's some blobby kind of animal, and it, it has a mouth. And this mouth, it eats things. So there's food, food pellets come into the mouth of the little animal. Well, it's going to need a digestive tract, and it's going to need to expel that um, food at some point. And if this is really a mouth that you can eat in, oops, that's not right. My eraser is not very good here. Yeah, okay, I can't do that. Um, let me just draw the whole thing again. So basically what would have to look like is it has a mouth and then, you know, the top of the animal, but the digestive tract would literally split the animal into two pieces. And then they would just fly away from each other. <laughs> you cannot have a digestive tract in two dimensions. And maybe that's kind of important to you. But, you know, um, maybe that's not important to you, right? Like, why can't we just have an animal that looks like this? That, you know, can eat something, digest it, and spit it out using the same thing. I, I kind of buy the intuition that says two-dimensional space is a little bit too simple to have um, complicated, intelligent life in it. But I'm always very, very wary of reasoning from our experience with questions like this. Of course, 
We live in a world where we have three dimensions to take advantage of, and we do, and it helps us be extremely complex. Um, therefore, it is hard for us to imagine complex life arising in two-dimensional space. But the fact that it's hard for us to imagine does not mean it's impossible. It's very hard to imagine a proof that it's impossible, but I get that there's some logic to that. And if you went down from two-dimensional space to one-dimensional space, it would even be worse. So maybe that's a good argument, maybe it's not, maybe we just don't know enough right now to say. What about dimensions larger than three? You might think if there were more than three dimensions of space, then we could be even more complicated, right? If we can have complex life in 3D, then we could have even more in four dimensions, etc. And maybe that's true, but, but Max points out another interesting fact that is, that is kind of well known. Um, remember, we live on a planet that orbits a sun, right? And we already talked about Kepler's laws. And so there's a little elliptical orbit. Isaac Newton showed that you could actually derive these elliptical orbits from the inverse square law for gravity. This doesn't work in three dimension, in larger than three dimensions of space. You can have orbits, okay? You can have a, a planet orbiting the sun in three dimensions. But remember, one of Newton's insights was the other planets gently perturb you out of your orbit, right? It's not just you and the sun moving around in the solar system. We also have Jupiter and Mars and Venus and all those other things. So it is only in three dimensional of space. In only in three-dimensional space, that planetary orbits are stable. So what about dimensions greater than three? These orbits would be unstable. What does that mean? It means that, oops, you have some position, you have some velocity or some momentum, okay? What if you just, and you're going around in some orbit, what if you just tweak it a little bit? What if you have some force, like another planet, that moves you away from your orbit? What would happen in dimensions larger than three is that rather than just being in a slightly different orbit, you would either spiral into the center or escape to infinity. Those are the generic things that could happen. That's what it means for the orbits to be unstable. You could move in a perfect circle, but if your circle is not perfect in four or five or six dimensions of space, then you could not orbit forever and ever and ever. So maybe we think that for intelligent life to arise, you need something like planets moving around stars in long-lived orbits. Again, you know, I don't know that you really need that. Um, I'm pretty much wholly unconvinced by this. You know, the, the two-dimensional space, okay, I get it. It's, it's hard for us to be quite this simple. But the four- or five-dimensional space seems like the complexity still has plenty of room to exist, even if the way that complex structures would arise would be very, very different in this kind of world than in ours. So I'm not sure that we have any reason yet um, to disbelieve on anthropic grounds that we could have lived in dimensions greater than three. Another way of saying this whole argument is the uh, tying your shoelaces argument. Uh, exactly because we said three dimensions are the number of dimensions in which strings can hit each other generically, if you try to make a knot, if you try to literally tie a knot with a one-dimensional string in four dimensions of space, there are no knots that can instantly that cannot instantly be undone, okay? So if you're in two dimensions, you can't tie a knot because the strings can't cross each other in the first place. If you're in four dimensions, they can always just pass right through and they can undo the knot. I have no intuition that tying your shoelaces is really, really important, but maybe that's the reason why we live in three-dimensional space. Okay. So again, I'm not here in this particular um, discussion to give you the final answer. I'm here to say these are potentially answerable questions and we should be thinking about them. Now, let's shift gears. Let's shift gears rather dramatically here. Um, what I was just trying to do was explain how we can think about why space has three dimensions. Now I want to think about why is there space at all? <laughs> why is space a thing? And there, there's different angles you can take on this question, of course. Um, you know, why is there the universe? Why does anything exist rather than any, nothing? This is a, it's a different set of questions. What I, what I really mean by this is, why does the stuff of physics take the form of stuff living in space? Why can we organize the world into objects with locations, okay? That might seem like um, so big a question that we don't even know how to make the first little uh, progress in answering it, but we actually do. There's, there's a context in which we can address this question quite 
directly. And what that context is, is yet another reformulation of classical mechanics. Remember, we said that there was Newtonian mechanics, and this was the uh, F equals MA way of doing things. So you have some particle or some object with a position and a momentum, and then you chug forward in time and ask what it does. Then we said that there is the least action way, which was you take an initial position and you take a final position, both with some fixed times, and you find the path in between them that minimizes a certain thing called the action. So it's a more global versus local point of view. You might think that those two options uh, are all you get, but there is another way called the Hamiltonian point of view. So this is a way of formulating classical mechanics. It's not a different theory. It's yet another reformulation of exactly the same theory. It seems at first glance like a needless bit of formalism, okay? Like you're taking something you understand perfectly well. The Hamiltonian point of view is very close to the Newtonian point of view. It's not really like the least action point of view, although there's a relationship there also. It's still, you start with initial conditions and you chug them forward in time but how you phrase what the initial conditions are is a little bit different and how you get the equations of motion is a little bit different. It's not just F equals MA. So it can at first glance seem just like uh, a needlessly abstract mathematical reformulation, but once you get to higher level physics concepts, the Hamiltonian perspective is the way to go. For instance, in quantum mechanics, the Schrodinger equation relies completely on the idea that you have a Hamiltonian and that's how you formulate physics. So what is going on here? Remember that uh, phase space, which was the space of initial conditions, or conditions at any one time, is the, was the space of positions x and momenta p, okay? And we said that you could chunk forward in time by saying that uh, the velocity is, let me say it this way, that uh, the rate of change of position is given by the velocity, which is given by momentum over the mass, and the rate of change of the velocity over time is the acceleration, which is given by the force over the mass. This was the Newtonian way of thinking about it. So really, in the Newtonian way of thinking about it, the thing that exists, if you have space here, x, y, and this is time, okay, then you have a trajectory x of t, and that's what matters. x as a function of time is what matters. The velocity is derived from the motion of x, okay? The Hamiltonian way is different. The Hamiltonian way says, look at this um, structure that we have of phase space here, okay, x and p. Put x and p on more of an equal footing. So rather than thinking of the momentum as something that is derived from position by taking the velocity then multiplying by the mass, p equals mv, this is the usual way of thinking about it, rather than doing that, say that the position and the velocity are, true, are two truly independent things, okay? And construct from these independent things a function of them, a function of space, phase space called the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian, you know, it's basically the energy. That's what it is, right? So it's basically the energy. But it's the energy, why well, I'm saying basically is because it's the energy as a function of position and velocity. Position and momentum, sorry, position and momentum. That's the whole point, is that it's not a function of position and velocity, it's a function of position and momentum. So, you know, we said that the energy equals, sorry for the math here, but I think the concepts are easy enough to follow. Energy is kinetic plus potential. And we had little formulas. Kinetic energy is one half mass times velocity squared. Potential energy is just some function V of X. It only depends on X, not on the velocity or the momentum. So if velocity is momentum divided by mass, then this equals one half p squared divided by m, right? If you plug in v equals p over v, and the potential is still just v of x. So in other words, this energy, this is now the Hamiltonian. It is a function of x and p. It equals 1 half p squared over m plus v of x. See, there's no 
velocities that appear in there anymore, just momentum p and position x. Okay, again, it seems like a kind of abstract, nonsensical way of rewriting things we already knew, but here's the point. There, there's a conceptual issue that comes along when people are first introduced to this, because if we go back to our picture of space, here's x, y, and time, I want to make that look like y. Time is up here, and we have this trajectory going here. You know, we say, look, if you have a point on the trajectory where the particle is moving with some velocity, okay, then how in the world can the velocity be independent of the position, right? It can't be. The velocity is derived from the position. Um, that's all true. In this picture, that is true. But what I want you to try to imagine is that we, forgetting about the velocity, okay, we're imagining there's something called the momentum. And at every moment of time, let me just undo this, undo the complications of my picture. At every moment of time, we have two things. Let, let's, in fact, let's even get rid of the trajectory, okay? We have the position x and we have the momentum p. So the momentum is still a momentum, but these are two pieces of data that we're giving you, the location and the momentum. And then rather than saying the position is defined, the, the momentum is defined to be the mass times the velocity, we say there are now two equations of motion. There's one equation that replaces F equals MA, forces mass times acceleration, which says that the velocity, the rate of change of the momentum you think about that, momentum was mass times velocity, so rate of change of velocity, acceleration. This is just ma, which is just the force. That's an equation of motion. dp dt, I'm going to erase the part in between, equals f. That's the replacement for f equals ma. And there's another equation of motion that says that the derivative of position with respect to time, which is supposed to be velocity, velocity was uh, p over m. So it, that's what it still is, p over m. So you see these two equations, change of position with time is force, change of position, sorry, change of momentum with time is force, change of position with time is momentum over mass. There's no mention of velocity here. These two equations are on an equal footing. And in fact, you can derive these two equations from this Hamiltonian function. I'm not going to try to tell you how to do it, but that's the point. So what you imagine is, just to start from scratch, imagine that instead of drawing space here, let me draw phase space. So this is x, and this is p, and there's some function on here, okay, called the Hamiltonian, which is a function of x and p. And by taking the slope of the Hamiltonian in different directions, I can derive these two equations of motion, the equation for p and the equation for x. So in other words, yet other words, when I am drawing this picture of a trajectory through time, and I say, look, here's a trajectory through time, here's the velocity v, how in the world could the momentum possibly be not in the same direction? How in the world could the momentum be a separate thing? The answer is the momentum is defined to be a separate thing, but on the actual trajectory, there will be a relationship p equals mv. Just, just like in ordinary mechanics, I have f equals ma, I can solve for the actual trajectory that the particle takes, but I can imagine other trajectories. I can imagine the particle doing whatever it wants, violating the laws of physics, right? The point is p equals mv is not a definition. It's a new law of physics that you could imagine violating. You can imagine the momentum and the velocity pointing in separate directions, but they don't in the real world. That's the Hamiltonian point of view, okay? So the Hamiltonian point of view is you start with this function of phase space, x and p, you can derive these equations, and they are exactly the same as the equations of Newtonian mechanics. So why am I telling you this, right? This is, that question will appear many, many times in these videos. Why am I telling you this? Why are we bothering with all this formalism? Well, the answer is because these equations and this picture really do put p and x on kind of an equal footing right? They treat them almost symmetrically. There's little details here, but basically, rather than p being derived 
from the velocity and therefore from the position, it has a life of its own. There, it's, a, it's a quantity all by itself. There's the location, there's the momentum. These two quantities go into defining the Hamiltonian and from them we get the laws of physics. So from that perspective, we've undone the idea that position is somehow prior to momentum. In Newton's way of thinking about it, were he, were he to have defined momentum, uh, he would just say, well, yeah, position over time is what matters. And momentum comes from that. Here we're saying that momentum matters all by itself, just as much as position does. So now we can ask, well, if that's true, why do we live in space? Why not living in momentum space? <laughs> momentum space exists. Again, it's not, it, that's um, the mathematician's use of the word space. It is a space of possible things. Phase space, which equals the set of all positions and momenta, is, is six dimensional. But space is only three-dimensional. Why do we take this three-dimensional part of phase space that we call space and make it primary? Why do we make it central? Why do we make it the important thing? It's not even a question you would ask in good old Newtonian way of thinking about things. It was the important thing. We put that in. William Rowan Hamilton comes along. He invents the Hamiltonian way of looking at things. There's various senses, which we're not going to go into, in which the Hamiltonian way of looking at things is more fundamental, more powerful. And from that perspective, there's a new question you would never have thought to ask. Why don't we live in momentum space? Um, so we don't fully know the answer to this, but we kind of know. This is a situation where we know the basic reason why things are the certain way they are. We just have yet to work out all of the details. And here's the basic reason why. Imagine that you have two billiard balls moving toward each other in good old Newtonian mechanics, okay? So they have a position, x1, x2, and they have a momentum, p1, p2. And if they're billiard balls, so they don't have, you know, forget about the gravitational force of them or anything like that. Neither of these billiard balls will know about the existence of the other one or be affected by it until they hit each other, right? Until they smack into each other in the middle. In other words, they do not interact until they are at the same point in space. There is no analogous question, no, no analogous statement about momentum. So if the two billiard balls had the same momentum or the opposite momentum, but were pointed in different directions so they would never hit each other, they don't interact with each other. There's no sense in which having the same momentum or equal but opposite momenta has anything to do with whether you are interacting with each other. So the motto here is interactions. This is a simple example, but we can extend it and generalize it are local in space, real space, the space of all possible positions. It's when you're at the same position that you interact with something, not when you're at the same momentum. And even if you do include gravity and things like that, we'll talk about this, but it's still true that you only interact when you're at the same position in space. So what this suggests, this is, everyone knows this, this is, not everyone knows this, but this is a well-known fact, interactions are local in space, locality, okay, in physics. But to answer our question, why do we live in space, why not momentum space, this fact that interactions are local in space suggests an answer. Space, as opposed to momentum space or phase space or anything like that, the space of all locations is the thing in which interactions are local. So in other words, if you started, if someone handed you a Hamiltonian as a function of position momentum, but they didn't tell you which was position and which was momentum, okay, you could figure it out. If this Hamiltonian was supposed to be, you know, the, the game that you play in physics, 
Uh, when I say there's a Hamiltonian function, what I mean is you tell me the physical system. It's some billiard balls, or it's some planets with gravitational fields, or it's a spring, or a pendulum, or whatever it is. And then you can figure out what the Hamiltonian of that system is. You know, we, we wrote down this simple thing, kinetic energy plus potential energy, but you can generalize that. Electromagnetism, standard model of particle physics, whatever it is. All of these different systems have their own Hamiltonian. In fact, they are defined by their Hamiltonian. Once you tell me what the objects are and what their Hamiltonian is, that defines the theory. So what I'm suggesting here is if someone gave you a Hamiltonian but disguised which parts of the phase space were positions and which were momenta, you could figure it out because you could look at that Hamiltonian and say, okay, what are the variables with respect to which different parts of the system are interacting locally when the variables take on the same values? And you would call that space. Okay, so there seems to be some sense in which you can uh, understand why we live in space, why not momentum space. There's still a question, why is there, why are there any dimensions with respect to which interactions are local? Why is locality a thing? That I don't know, you know, that I have no clues right now. Why is there a locality? It's not because it necessarily needed to be that way. Um, if you imagine the space of all Hamiltonians, the space of all theories of physics, most of them would not have any notion of locality whatsoever. It does not seem to be generic. Uh, there's something special about the real laws of physics that we have in our world that has this feature of locality. And uh, as far as I know, no one's really sure why. But you should be inspired by the fact uh, earlier in the video where we talked about even such a basic question as why are there three dimensions of space might be answerable in the right context. Maybe questions like this are answerable too, even though right now we don't have an answer. Maybe some of you have answers, I don't know. Um, let me wrap this up a little bit by saying, you know, by going back to the billiard balls and saying, okay, I said we ignore the gravitational force, right, between these two things, because if I have two objects, you know, let's ask about gravity. If I have two objects that are far away from each other, um, object one, object two, some distance R between them, the force between them, if this is capital M and this is little m, they both exert the same force on each other. That's an R there, just to be clear. Which is Newton's constant times mass one times mass two over R squared. So big M pulls on little m, little m pulls on big M. They're not at the same point in space. Did I lie to you? Uh, so Newton worried about this, right? This is action at a distance. He had this intuition that it makes sense for billiard balls to bump into each other when they're located at the same point in space, and yet his law of universal gravity seemed to say that even when things were not at the same point in space, they were still interacting with each other. And he worried about this. He wrote in the Principia Mathematica, this is an issue that he basically leaves for future generations to solve. He knew it's probably possible to do better. Um, very often when physicists talk about this, they give credit for answering this to Einstein. Einstein came up with general relativity, as we said, in 1915, and there, there is a gravitational field that is defined by the curvature of space-time, and there uh, things are perfectly local. But in fact, the, the, the answer is already implicit in that sentence, but it way predates Einstein. The answer is there is a gravitational field. We use that language all the time. You probably use that language yourself. Um, the gravitational field of the sun pulls on the earth, okay? So, but there's a subtle but crucially important thing going on here. Um, Newton's way of formulating it was, there just is a force acting on the earth just because there exists the sun 93 million miles away, okay? There's nothing in between the Earth and the sun. It was our old friend, Laplace, pierre Simon Laplace, as far as I know, again, the history is not my thing, but this is what I think it was, who said you could rewrite Newton's law of gravity in terms of a gravitational potential phi as a function of x. Don't ask me why they call it phi, but that's what they often do. And so what, what Laplace said is if we, if we plot uh, phi, it's, it's usually a negative number. So there you go. Here is the distance between, let's say, here's the sun, 
Here's the Earth. And phi, it's on the vertical axis here, looks like this. And he invented two equations. One equation was, what does phi do? And the answer is, when you have a big, massive object, phi pushes it down. Okay, that's why the sun is pushing down phi down here at r equals zero. The other equation says, if you're a little object, even if you're a big object, if you're an object that is in the midst of some phi, if you're feeling the influence of some phi, there is a force on you that is just like the force we talked about for potential energy before. That's why it's called the gravitational potential field. The force is minus the slope of the potential. So Laplace invents a set of equations which says there is something in between the sun and the earth, and that something is the gravitational field, the gravitational potential field, and I can write down equations for it where there's no action at a distance at all, right? Where the force, the, the influence of the sun on the field only happens where the sun is located, and then the field obeys its equation, which tells what the, what is the field right there? It depends on what is the field right next to it on one side and what right next to it on the other side. And guess what? You use calculus to relate what the field is doing at one point to neighboring points. But that's all that affects it. All that the field at one point cares about is what the field is at immediately neighboring points. There's no influence very, very far away. So the action at a distance has gone away. It's, the, it's field theory. This is the answer. Why? Is there no action at a distance? The answer is uh, the world is made of fields. Or at least at this point of the analysis, uh, forces come from fields. But we'll eventually get to the point where we just say the whole world is made of fields. That is the ultimate manifestation, the ultimate impact of locality. There is no action at a distance. Now, I, I should say this became... More complicated, as many things did when quantum mechanics came along. We'll get to that at some later point. But if you've heard the phrase action at a distance, you may have heard it in the context of spooky action at a distance. And that uh, appears in quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, the following thing can happen. I can have two particles that are spinning. So we will, you know, Draw this as one particle spinning that way, another particle spinning in the opposite direction, okay? So we might call this spin up, spin down, and we might draw that in quantum mechanics as just an up arrow and a down arrow. Two particles can be spinning in opposite directions, okay? What can happen quantum mechanically, as you probably know, is that these individual particles with their individual spins might not be simply spinning up or down, but in some superposition, in some combination of spinning up or spinning down, until we measure them. And once we measure them, you can immediately, you will only ever get spin up or spin down, not some combination. So these two particles in quantum mechanics can be entangled with each other. The two particle state can be a combination of both particles are spin up and both particles are spin down. In other words, you don't know the spin of either one particle if you observe it, but when you observe it, you instantly know the spin of the other particle. And furthermore, there's no reason at all for these two particles to be near each other. So you can have one particle over here and another particle over here let me draw this particle better, okay? So we don't know the spin of either one of these. This is usually in the trade Alice's particle and Bob's particle. So we know that both of these particles are spinning in the same way. In fact, even if you orient their spins to try to measure them in some other axis other than vertically, if you measure them horizontally or whatever, you always know they're spinning the same way. And what we don't know is what way that is. So when Alice measures her particle and she says, ah, it's spinning up, then Alice instantly knows that Bob's particle is also spinning up. And if you believe that the quantum state is real, if it describes the real world, then it seems that Bob's quantum state changed instantly, even though Alice is very, very far away. 
So it seems like, even though Newton and Laplace and Einstein had vanquished the idea of action at a distance in favor of locality and the importance of space and spatial location, quantum mechanics seems to be bringing back the idea of action at a distance, and Einstein did not like that. Uh, happily, you cannot use this kind of entanglement in quantum mechanics to send signals, because even though Alice now knows what Bob's spin is, Bob still doesn't know. Bob has learned nothing from this, okay? Unless Alice tells Bob by some good old classical slower-than-light communication device, Bob is not able to do anything with the fact that Alice measured her spin. So it seems like a weird little loophole that the way that we talk about what's happening involves action at a distance, but no observational outcome is actually influenced by it. No information is transmitted. What are we going to do about that? We'll have to wait till future lectures to do something about that. For, for this one, I just want to emphasize that uh, space has a meaning, but we're able, we're allowed, we're encouraged to interrogate what that meaning is and where it came from. Why is space three-dimensional? Why is there space at all? Might space be just emergent from some deeper quantum description or something like that? We can talk about that more. We're allowed to talk about that. That's the good news. The other thing, let me mention, uh, for those of you who don't know, we do have a Q&A. Uh, if you have questions, leave them in the YouTube or in the blog post. I will try to answer some of them. Clearly, if we want to go further in this direction, we need to talk about time. So usually I'm going to try to keep the next big idea that we talk about secret, but given that we just talked about space, next time we'll talk about time.